Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, welcome to the National Press Club and today's Westpac address. Thanks for you. Our guest today is Lord Jonathan Sumpton, former Justice of the UK Supreme Court and author. And the title of today's address is What's going, What is Going On in the United Kingdom? Uh, Laura Tingle, our president, will uh, moderate today's proceedings. And uh, as you know, Laura is the uh, 7.30 chief political correspondent. Um, with us today is Georgina Downer, the CEO of the Robert Menzies Institute, who are uh, uh, taking the tour, sponsoring the tour of uh, uh, Jonathan Sumption. And uh, so she's here today. Welcome to her. Uh, Heather Henderson, the daughter of Sir Robert and Dame Patty Menzies. Uh, sp very special welcome to you. Thank you for coming down. Um, so Robert for first spoke here in September 1964, it reminds us that we're having our 60th anniversary next year. He followed a speech by Brian Epstein, the manager of the Beatles, and Sir Robert pipped uh, the manager of the, for, for an audience that day, so <laughs> I thought that was quite interesting to know. W welcome to Margaret Reid, uh, former President of the Senate and Senator for Canberra. Welcome to you, uh, John Caron also with us today. Uh, there is a further speech this week, uh, which is the Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, and clearly it'll be about the National Anti-Corruption Commission proposal, and uh, that's being well booked out. Uh, uh, very strong journalist interest in that particular event. Uh, everyone has a mobile phone. I just ask you to take an opportunity to put it to silent. A uh, bit of a distraction when it goes off during the event. So. Uh, Welcome. Uh, I'll ask our guest and Laura to make their way forward. Part of the club. I hope you enjoy uh, today's event. Thanks very much. I see you've got two signs now. Westpac address. My name's Laura Tingle and I'm the club's president. There was a long period in recent Australian political history where it felt like our politics had reached newly bizarre and unfathomable levels, both in terms of the internal warfare and assassinations within our parliamentary parties and in terms of the strange twists and turns our policy discussions had taken. In more recent times, we look at the UK and frankly can only scratch our heads. Our speaker today will hopefully be able to enlighten us a bit uh, on just what is happening there, whether that is from his perspective as an eminent lawyer and judge, a supporter of the UK staying in the EU, or perhaps particularly as an historian of the twists and turns of the 100 Years' War, which hopefully won't be replicated. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Lord Jonathan Sumpton to address us today. Well, good afternoon. Uh, what's going on in the United Kingdom? Uh, the answer gets more complicated every time one opens a newspaper. Something very odd is clearly happening uh, in the United Kingdom, a country which was a byword uh, for two centuries for political stability, ha has changed its government more frequently in recent years than Italy. Uh, the Conservative Party has been continuously in power since 2010, yet we have had four prime ministers 
in the past six years. Two, David Cameron and Theresa May were forced out as a result uh, of disputes over Brexit. Uh, Boris Johnson, uh, the main beneficiary uh, of these casualties, uh, was himself forced out by the same backbenchers who had chosen him for lack of a basic measure of competence and integrity. The fourth has been in office for just a month, but it is already an open question how long she will remain there. So what is happening? Um, I should start perhaps with a declaration of interest. I don't have one. Uh, <laughs> I have no party affiliation or allegiance uh, and no political home. Uh, partly, uh, this is uh, because of the changes in UK politics that I'm about to describe. Uh, partly, it is because uh, my eight years as a judge uh, made it a habit of mind. Uh, I've therefore viewed the advent of successive governments uh, with equal indifference. What I do care about, however, is the way in which we are governed, which accounts for at least some of the views that I take about our current situation. Uh, the recent instability of British politics is part of the fallout of the referendum uh, of 2016, which resulted in the decision to leave the European Union. Uh, Brexit was an issue of major significance for our economic and political future, which aroused very strong passions and split Britain roughly down the middle. The victory of Leave in 2016 was very narrow, 52% against 48%. Uh, it also, and this is perhaps its most enduring significance, it pitted, it, it reinforced some of the major fault lines in British politics. It pitted the English against the Scots, who voted by a large majority to remain. The result was a significant boost in support for Scottish nationalism. It pitted London against the English regions. London is by far the most prosperous part of the UK, with about a seventh of its population and nearly a quarter of its economic output. The regions include some of the poorest parts of the country and all of the areas affected by the decline of heavy industry over the past 60 years. Uh, in London, we voted by a very large majority to remain, and almost all the English provinces voted by varying majorities to leave. Uh, Brexit also pitted those with academic and professional qualifications and high incomes who voted overwhelmingly to remain, while those without these advantages voted to leave. Uh, this has obviously aggravated an existing problem of inequality. We are uh, among the most unequal societies in the world uh, in a class of our own after the United States. Uh, above all, it, it pitted the young who voted by a large margin to remain uh, against an older generation which by an equally large margin wanted to leave. Now that comes on top of quite serious issues of generational injustice in the UK which have existed for many years. Young graduates leave UK universities with a heavy burden of debt arising from the state-funded loans uh, which enable them to go to university. Uh, their repayments are equivalent uh, to a very substantial marginal tax rate exceeding about 50% at a time uh, of their life when their earnings are relatively low. By comparison, those over 65 uh, benefit uh, from, uh, uh, they are the major beneficiaries of public expenditure with gold-plated pensions uh, in which cost of living increases are locked in by law. Uh, the young have been progressively excluded from the housing market by planning restrictions and steep rises in land values. It's not therefore very surprising to find that political allegiances in the UK very closely follow differences of age. The Conservatives have been in power now for 12 years, but the only demographic in which they actually have a majority support is the over 55s. Among those under 30, uh, support hovers between 15 uh, and 20 percent. All of this promises a powerful political explosion in the next few years. Uh, many of the political and economic dilemmas uh, which currently divide Britain are the direct result uh, of the decision to leave the EU. The problem is that the only way 
in which we can successfully compete against the huge friction-free market on our doorstep from which we have now excluded ourselves is to become a low-tax, uh, low-regulation economy, the vision sometimes referred to as Singapore on Thames. The problem is that there is no appetite for such a thing among the electorate, even if they voted leave in the referendum. When it comes to public services and protective regulation, the British want plenty of both. Uh, and in this respect, they have exactly the same aspirations uh, as the rest of Europe that they have left behind. Uh, Boris Johnson uh, fought the 2019 general election on the slogan, Get Brexit Done. But there remain major items of, of unfinished business. The best known uh, is the uh, problem uh, about relations with the Republic of Ireland resulting from the Northern Irish Protocol, which governs the treatment of the Irish island uh, uh, after our departure. Uh, but perhaps dwarfing even that insignificance is the fact uh, that the new economic model, which is to replace membership of the EU, whether it is to be Singapore on Thames or something else, remains undecided and extremely controversial. Uh, many Remainers uh, bitterly resent Britain's enforced departure from the EU, while Leavers refuse to acknowledge the increasingly obvious economic damage which Brexit has caused. So Brexit is an issue which refuses to die. It isn't done. And for as long as that continues, uh, its corrosive effect on British politics will persist. Uh, the prime function uh, of democratic politics is to accommodate differences of opinion and interest among citizens so that they can live together in some sort of harmony. Uh, you could hardly have a better illustration of that uh, uh, than the current divisions about Brexit in the United Kingdom. In a normal political world, uh, some compromise would have been arrived at, uh, which would not have satisfied the zealots on either side of the debate, uh, but which most people uh, would have been able to live with. Uh, for example, we could have remained part of the European Customs Union, which, uh, while standing outside the uh, f financial and decision-making structure of the EU. Uh, that would have lost us the right to negotiate our own trade agreements, but would have required us, and would have required us to accept certain common standards, but it would have resolved the Northern Ireland problem and would have avoided the economic damage arising from friction at the borders. Our political system, however, has wholly failed to cope with the dilemmas and divisions uh, following Brexit. Uh, the reason is to be found in the crises that have engulfed both major political parties in the last decade. Political parties have a very significant role in any representative democracy. Historically, uh, they have been powerful engines of national compromise and as such effective mediators between the citizen and the state. This is because parties are not usually monolithic bodies with a fixed ideology. They are coalitions of opinion, uh, united only by a loose consistency of outlook uh, and a common desire uh, to win elections. Uh, politics is not a question, uh, it's not a quest for truth. It is a marketplace. Uh, to achieve a critical size uh, and command a parliamentary majority, political parties have to bid for support to an altogether wider constituency than their own base. They have to adjust uh, their uh, offering uh, to changes in public sentiment uh, uh, and to priorities that seem likely to affect voting patterns. That is why, although the Conservative Party has existed in an institutionally recognizable form for about 200 years, its policies uh, have mutated constantly uh, over the decades. Uh, both of the two main national parties, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, have developed in ways which have effectively destroyed the political market, as I've just summarised it. Uh, Britain, like Australia, 
uh, uses the first past, uh, unlike Australia, sorry, uses the first past the post system uh, in uh, general elections. We do not have either alternative vote systems or proportional representation in the strict sense of the word. The effect of first past the post uh, is to entrench the position of the two major national parties and to create a duopoly of parties taking power alternately. Coalitions are very rare. New parties find it impossible to get any representation in Parliament uh, unless its supporters are geographically concentrated, like the Scottish Nationalists. For many years, this system uh, was justified, among other people, by me, uh, on the grounds that it produced stable governments uh, with the authority to govern. Uh, compromise and debate did occur, but it occurred within political parties uh, as they attempted to draw up a program with sufficient appeal to a broad basis in the electorate. It did not occur between political parties, uh, as it does uh, in countries like Germany, uh, where coalitions, uh, negotiated coalitions, after elections are normal. In the last 10 years, this mechanism has ceased to be a recipe for stability uh, and has become instead uh, the source of weak and unstable single-party governments. The first-past-the-post system means that fringe parties, fringe opinions, can only get a voice in Parliament by taking over and colonising one of the two major political parties. This is, in fact, relatively easy to do if you are sufficiently organised. By joining your local constituency party, you can influence the choice of parliamentary candidates and you can have a decisive say, under the current rules of both parties, in the choice of its leader. Constituency members are, by definition, activists. Ideologically, most of them stand at the outer edge of the spectrum of opinion in their party. The choice of both local parliamentary candidates and the party leader uh, is in the hands of comparatively small numbers of activists and zealots representing no one but themselves, as against the party's MPs, who once had the only voice in the choice of leader and whose main concern is quite different. Their interest is to find a leader with a broad appeal beyond the base, which might possibly get them re-elected. In 2019, uh, uh, tactical entryism uh, brought the Labour Party to its knees. Tony Blair and Gordon Brown had successfully turned the Labour Party into the Social Democratic Party that it had been during the 1950s and 60s. Uh, policies such as nationalisation and heavily redistributive taxation, which had been traditional parts uh, of the socialist programme, were junked in an attempt to broaden the party's appeal. Uh, that policy was rewarded with a large parliamentary majority in 1997 and with substantial victories in the next two general elections, the longest continuous period that the Labour Party has ever been in power in the UK. But the payback came after 2010, when the old left, encouraged by the defeat of their party in the general election of that year, uh, and by the financial crash of 2007-08, uh, regrouped and began to take over the constituency associations. The result was a schism between the parliamentary party, most of which adhered to the social democratic model, and the wider membership, which was overwhelmingly left. It was the membership of the trades unions and the constituency associations uh, which forced Jeremy Corbyn on the parliamentary party in 2015 and sustained him against the repeated attempts of Labour MPs to get rid of him. The result was that the party stopped trying to broaden its appeal uh, beyond its membership base and went down to its worst ever defeat uh, in 2019. It lost even the traditional working class constituencies of the industrial Midlands, which had been the bedrock of its support since the foundation of the party at the end of the 19th century. Labour is currently led by Keir Starmer, who has drawn the party back from the brink of extinction. He is an uncharismatic man, but a fundamentally decent and moderate politician 
who believes in the old idea of a broad church. He was elected as the only candidate who seemed likely uh, to have much chance of winning an election. But he is there on sufferance. He's under pressure uh, to adopt a more leftward stand uh, and will certainly be ousted if he doesn't deliver victory at the next election. A very similar process has occurred in the Conservative Party, which has been very much more significant because the Conservative Party has been in power since 2010. Britain's long-running political crisis is really uh, a crisis of the Conservative Party. The issue which transformed the Conservative Party was Brexit. Until recently, most Conservative MPs supported Britain's continuing membership of the EU, as indeed did most MPs of whatever political colour. The transformation of the Conservative Party into an anti-European party began in, 19, in the 1990s, it accelerated after 2000 uh, as a result of the rise of Nigel Farage's UK Independence Party, UKIP. Because the, of the first-past-the-post system uh, and the wide geographical distribution of UKIP's supporters, it never had any real chance of getting representation in Parliament. In the 2015 general election, UKIP came third after Labour, and the Conservatives, with 12.6% of the national vote. But it got only one MP, and he had originally won his seat as a Conservative. But UKIP was nevertheless a very significant force. It threatened to deprive the Conservative Party of seats by drawing off Conservative voters and letting Labour in. Uh, this uh, would have been very much more difficult under an electoral system based on alternative vote uh, or uh, proportional representation. As a result of the threat from UKIP, David Cameron was forced uh, to promise a referendum on EU membership uh, in the manifesto of his party in 2015, a referendum which he was confident of winning, uh, but which, as we all now know, he lost. He resigned the day after the referendum and was succeeded by Theresa May. This led to a deeply divided parliament between 2015 and 2019. The Conservative Party in the House of Commons uh, was split. Uh, the Conservative Party uh, in the constituencies uh, was increasingly uh, intent on leaving the EU. Mrs May adopted the rhetoric of the extreme anti-Europeans in her party, but worked behind the scenes to effect some kind of compromise. At the opposite end of the spectrum within the Conservative Party, a minority of MPs pressed with Labour support uh, for an agreement with the EU which would have conserved uh, some at least of the economic advantages of, of membership, even if it meant accepting parts of EU law. Uh, the critical issue was the status of Northern Ireland. Uh, Theresa May uh, had planned to avoid a customs barrier across the island of Ireland uh, by a deal which effectively placed the whole of the UK, including Northern Ireland, within the customs union, or rather a modified version of the customs union. The result was deadlock, which was only broken in 2019, three years after the referendum. Uh, the party forced out Theresa May in July 2019 and chose Boris Johnson to replace her, he came in with a programme involving a much more complete break with the EU. Johnson purged the party of most of its pro-European MPs by depriving them of the party whip and preventing them from standing as Conservative candidates. They included many of the best known, uh, most talented and most experienced members of the Parliamentary Party. In the constituencies, UKIP supporters joined their local conservative associations in large numbers and selected candidates of their own colour. A general election was then called, in which the conservatives won a large absolute majority, mainly because of public hostility to Jeremy Corbyn and because they were fed up with the political paralysis over Brexit. The 2019 election 
completed the transformation of the Conservative Party into an overtly and extremely anti-European party in which there was no place for dissent or compromise. Every one uh, of, the, of the purged Conservative MPs uh, who tried to stand as an independent was soundly defeated by the official candidate. Uh, the result of these developments in both major parties uh, has been uh, to uh, drive policy towards the extremes at either end and to limit the choices available to the electorate at general elections. Uh, this has produced a progressive alienation uh, of citizens from the political process and a rising tide of public anger about parties at both ends of the spectrum. It has also had a significant effect on the conduct of government. Boris Johnson had been chosen as leader because of his skills as a campaigner uh, and because uh, of his cut and dried attitude to Europe. But the oddity was that his MPs never really trusted his instincts or indeed his integrity. Johnson knew that he was much more popular in the constituency associations than he was among his own MPs. As a result, he governed through a cabinet drawn entirely from his loyalist supporters within the Parliamentary Conservative Party. No one suspected of any residual affection for Europe uh, or, or any doubts about Johnson himself was included. Uh, Liz Truss has done much the same. Before the referendum, uh, Mrs Truss had been an active Remainer. Afterwards, seeing that the path to promotion lay through the Leave movement, she reinvented herself as a Leaver, adopting most of the hardline positions of her new colleagues. Mrs Truss was not the preferred choice uh, of Conservative MPs. They voted uh, for her rival, Rishi Sunak, who had been the Chancellor of the Exchequer in Johnson's government. Mrs. Truss was foisted on the Parliamentary Party by the membership in the constituencies because she was ideologically more to their liking. In the leadership campaign, uh, Liz Truss had, camp had proposed a low-regulation Singapore-on-Thames-style regime as Britain's future. She had campaigned in the constituencies uh, on a promise to maintain high levels of expenditure, but at the same time uh, to reduce taxes, a policy uh, about which many of her MPs uh, had strong misgivings. It was also uh, a, a direct repudiation of many traditional features of conservative policy, paternalism, financial prudence, and a rejection of ideology, uh, as well uh, as a, a rejection of the uh, more Pacific one-nation tradition of conservatism. She knows, like Johnson, that most of her MPs didn't want her uh, and did not indeed share her vision. Uh, she could have sought to unify her party uh, by choosing a broad-based cabinet, but that would have resulted in resignations once she sought to impose the policies on which she had conducted her leadership campaign. So instead, she surrounded herself with loyalists, some of whom are conspicuously lacking in either stature or ability. Uh, her rival in the leadership election uh, had fought on an economic programme which might be regarded as more responsible, and his supporters have been rigorously excluded from government. At least one of the ministers whom Mrs. Truss dismissed on the first day of taking office was told that he had to go because he had backed the wrong horse in the leadership campaign. He is now one of the two principal leaders of the anti-Truss movement within the Conservative Party. In effect, both Truss and Johnson have behaved as if they were uh, leading an embattled minority government from a bunker uh, even though they had an absolute majority in theory uh, of 80 seats in Parliament. The result of all this has been a highly disruptive uh, 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 government uh, and a, an authoritarian style of government. Parliament was famously described by Boris Johnson's advisor, Dominic Cummings, as a pond life. In the first few months after the December 2019 
election, when his standing was at its height, Johnson treated it with contempt, making policy announcements elsewhere and using his majority to overturn disciplinary decisions against friends of his in Parliament who had been accused of uh, improper lobbying operations. The Supreme Court was threatened with abolition because it had dis decided two major constitutional cases against the government uh, when it tried to avoid parliamentary scrutiny uh, of its Brexit policy. The BBC, which is thought to be too liberal and too pro-European, has been threatened with the abolition of its license fee. The civil service is resented because of its habit of pointing out difficulties about current government policies, a position which is characterized as mere obstruction. Liz Truss inherited most of Boris Johnson's hit list and aggravated it with a remarkably high-handed approach to policy making of her own. The highly regarded permanent secretary to the treasury, uh, Sir Thomas Scholar, the highest ranking civil servant in the department, was the most experienced crisis manager in the civil service. He had consistently advised that high levels of unfunded expenditure would not be tolerated by the financial markets who would make it difficult uh, for the government to borrow to fill the gap. Uh, his uh, result was to be sacked peremptorily on Mrs. Truss's first day in office. The Bank of England uh, controls monetary policy and has a mandate to keep inflation low. Uh, this would have resulted in a substantial increase and will result in a substantial increase if the government goes in uh, for large unfunded tax cut cuts in interest rates affecting mortgages across the land. The Bank of England has been threatened with having its wings clipped. The Office of Budget Responsibility has the job of publishing an independent assessment of the economic implications of the government's financial decisions. They have been silenced. One result of all this has been the kind of ill-informed, ill-prepared decision-making which last month produced a budget which no respectable economist was able to defend, followed by a run on the pound, a doubling of the rate of interest, and an even sharper spike in inflation than the rest of Europe. Uh, it isn't even sound politics. Mrs. Truss has already been forced to retreat on her decision to abolish the top rate of taxation by a widely supported rebellion under her own MPs, who made it clear that they would not vote uh, for such a thing. She is likely to lose the next battle, which will be about her reported plans to save money by reducing the real value of social benefits. In a parliamentary system, it is difficult to be an authoritarian ruler if you have no authority in parliament, even in your own party, because they never wanted you in the first place. So where are we now? Johnson was sometimes described as Britain's answer to Donald Trump. The parallel is not actually very close, but there are some obvious points in common. Uh, our politics have become highly polarized with fewer points of contact between ideological opposites and therefore very high levels of political instability. There is the same intolerance of dissent uh, or unwelcome advice and the same tendency uh, to respond uh, to criticism by shooting the messenger. The quality of government, which depends not only on ministers, but critically on civil servants and parliamentarians, and on a depth of experience in a wide class of, of, politi of politicians, has declined as a result of the mounting hostility of government to all alternative sources of expertise. We do not suffer uh, from these ills to anything like the degree that Trump's America did, but we do suffer from them far more than is healthy for any pluralist democracy. Now, I'm not going to try to predict the future. Uh, in the long run, I suspect that we will revert to a more normal way of governing ourselves. In the end, experience usually persuades professional politicians that collaborative decision-making and consensus building work better uh, than slanging matches and top-down government. Uh, they are more efficient as well as politically wiser. Boris Johnson was incapable of learning from his mistakes or even recognizing them as mistakes. Uh, Liz Truss, I think, is better than that. 
I think that experience may well blunt her more da uh, damaging instincts. Uh, but she has two major political problems. One is that because of the way that she was chosen, she has no personal mandate and insufficient support in her own parliamentary party, let alone among the electorate at large. They are already talking of getting rid of her when Parliament reopens in a few days. Uh, her other problem uh, is that learning from experience takes time, and she hasn't got much of that. Assuming that she survives as Conservative leader, she will have only two years uh, before she must confront an unforgiving electorate at the next general election. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much. Um, I've got to say there's a lot of that is quite depressingly familiar in terms of uh, uh, the erosion of the institutions um, that underpin democracy um, in Australia. Um, I, I don't want to um, ask you to uh, make a forecast of what's going to happen as such, but uh, I want to put a scenario to you to, to just uh, draw out some of the, the ideas that you were talking about, about the role of the parliamentary parties um, and the decline in the quality of uh, politicians. Let's presume, uh, given where we are at the moment, that uh, Labor wins the next election. Uh, I suppose my questions to you are, and you've said that uh, Keir Starmer is a decent man, but not you know, the world's greatest, uh, most charismatic leader. Um, but if he wins convincingly, uh, what, what scope is there for the parliamentary party, the parliamentary Labor Party, to use the authority of that win to reclaim um, some sort of control over, or more control than he already has, over the agenda. And what what happens to the Conservatives then if they have a, a big loss? I mean, you were talking about the, the capacity of um, leaders to learn and politicians to learn. Uh, what happens if uh, they lose? Presume uh, Liz Truss survives till then, she's gone. But it doesn't sound like there's going to be anybody really left, given what Boris Johnson did to the party, to move the Conservatives back to a different position in the future. Well, looking at the first half of that question, what happens if a Labour government comes in in uh, two years' time, uh, the decisive battle will be about the manifesto. It's politically very difficult to push a party in power uh, into a more ex extreme version of traditional Labour doctrine if it's not in the manifesto. Moreover, somebody who has just won uh, a general election, especially if it's a convincing majority, is in a very powerful position politically. Uh, and I would not therefore anticipate um, uh, that there will be the sort of um, uh, uh, internal rebellions within the Labour Party that have currently crippled the Conservatives. The fate of the Conservatives is an, an interesting and difficult question to predict, and I'm not going to give you a very precise forecast. But um, first of all, I think you've got to remember that the Conservative Party has existed for, in its unrecognisable form for more than two centuries. It is, uh, among Western democracies, the most successful uh, election-winning machine uh, that has ever existed. Um, uh, it has been in power for that reason for uh, most of the last 200 years. Um, so it's not a party that one can ever easily write off. Um, I think that the experience of opposition uh, can be an extremely healing process, uh, though very few members of the Conservative Party are likely to look at it in that way. <laughs> the, the salvation of the Conservative Party, if it happens, will come by being thrown into opposition and having to rethink uh, its position. Now, although an awful lot of Conservatives have adopted uh, the anti-European uh, and um, uh, uh, Singapore-style mantras uh, uh, because it is um, the way to get places, that, of course, is not a factor that will apply once the Conservatives are on, uh, uh, in opposition. 
uh, and that programme has been decisively uh, rejected by the electorate. Now, I don't think that I said uh, that, that politicians generally uh, have uh, declined in quality. Uh, I think that those that get into government have. My, my, own view, my own view of the process is this. I think that if you look back at the quality of MPs over the decades and centuries, 75% of them have always been dunderheads. <laughs> um, the art of government uh, is to ensure that the effective decisions are made by the other 25%. There is plenty of talent in both parties, including the Conservative Party, but they've been relegated to the wings because they are not sufficiently enthusiastic admirers of either Johnson or Truss, and because of their record uh, on uh, issues relating uh, to Europe. All of this will decline in importance um, once they are in opposition, and one would expect a generation uh, of others to come forward, uh, which includes the, the, the current Parliamentary Conservative Party you could construct a cabinet of outstandingly able people if you were able to escape those two fundamental criteria for office under the current government. So I wouldn't rule, uh, rule out the Conservative Party. It represents one of the most powerful and long-standing traditions in British politics. I think that it will revive. Okay. The next question is from Nick Stewart. Thank you for such a crisp analysis of the, the current problem. Um, I'm wondering... Particularly uh, now, what, what do you think underlies that issue? Because it's not simply in the UK, it's in Australia, it's in the US, it's all around democracies. Is it the effect of the internet? We've seen the internet replace in many ways the, the uh, single forum that, that uh, democracies used to have where political debate used to take place, which was in the parliamentary arena. Or do you think it is the evolution of particular small group parties. You mentioned the, um, uh, the UKIP. Um, particular, we, we have similar organisations here in Australia that seem to be quite content to get 10% of the vote because they know that that 10% will give them f hands on the levers of power. They, they'll actually get the ability to influence government in a way that they didn't have before. What do you think comes first? What is the cause of our current problem? And if I may, a second question. I, I you said that a third question. Nick. <laughs> you you said twenty five percent not done to heads. Very, surely very that roughly. is an overestimate. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, surely uh, uh, more than than uh, eighty percent are are in fact done to heads. Uh, uh. Uh, well. Um, I, I'm not sure how you would conduct a more exact calculation. <laughs> uh, uh, but I think, uh, uh, as an approximate uh, rule of thumb, I think that's probably sound. Um, I mean, turning to your questions, um, I think that the major factor in changing the nature of the political debate has not been the internet. I think it's the fact that the social dimension of politics has vanished. Uh, both on the left and on the right. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, the Conservative Party had something like five million members. Uh, the Labour Party's membership was a bit more difficult to calculate because of the theoretical membership of every member of a trades union. But it was very substantial. Uh, currently, the number of members uh, of all three national political parties in the UK uh, is very small. The Conservatives have about 160,000 members. Labour have about a quarter of a million. Uh, the combined total of all three parties uh, is less than the membership of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Now, uh, th that's th th the reason for this change is that changes in habits of recreation uh, and so on uh, have meant uh, that um, membership of a political party is not is, is now exclusively a political fact. Uh, the people who join and pay subscriptions to political parties are activists, whereas uh, under a different social scheme of things, many of them 
were people who, they were certainly conservatives if they joined a conservative association, but they went uh, for the bingo, uh, the, um, the, the screened films, uh, the social outings, and so on. This is a whole dimension of sociability, which at any rate in the UK has vanished with the rise of television and the fall of much older and more collaborative club-like forms of sociability. So what we have now is political parties who are exclusively engaged, occupied, by people whose prime purpose in political life is to stuff their opinions down other people's throats. That, I think, is the main factor. Uh, it's been aggravated, of course, by the significant power enjoyed by political parties, by membership of political parties, now under the current regime, over what happens uh, at Westminster. I don't believe that the internet is a significant factor. Uh, the internet is essentially an amplifier of opinions that are there before. It raises the volume, but I think that its long-term impact on opinion is limited. Its main importance is that people uh, under 30 uh, who have a, a, a relatively low record of voting and turning out uh, at elections uh, tend to derive their news and some of their opinions from it, although generally what they are doing is they're looking for self-affirmation about opinions that they've already formed, which, of course, the Internet and its algorithms will supply in full measure. Um, that's, that's where I think that this comes from. Now, my answer is given in the light of my experience of the UK system and also, to some extent, systems in other European countries. I don't know how far that applies to Australia. If I could uh, just t take, uh, expand on that a little bit, um, what's the demographic? Uh, what are, what's the demographics of the membership uh, base of the, of the parties? I mean, in Australia, it's basically old people now who are members of political parties, and I, I take a point that it's political activists, and they can be in all age groups. But if, conserv if the conservative vote is only in a majority over 55. Um, you know, there, there's all sorts of interesting demographic trends happening there, presumably, in, both in the vote and in the membership of uh, yes. the parties. The membership of the Conservative Party, judging by a number of attempts that have been made by pollsters to work it out, is very heavily angled towards the, the older generation. But at the same time, the older generation are the ones who are more likely to have some residues of the old social notion of what membership of a political association means, whereas anyone aged 30 who joins a conservative association is, I should think, almost 100% certain to be a fanatic. Um, uh, I mean, I use the word fanatic loosely. Um, in, in its nice connotation. <laughs> um, the Labour Party is actually quite difficult to read. Um, polling evidence suggests that the average age of members of constituency Labour parties is also quite high, um, and uh, I suspect that the same phenomenon, that the social side is more dominant among the older members, also applies, though I'm guessing. Um, but uh, the enormous increase in the membership of the Labour Party um, when it was announced that um, paying a modest subscription would enable you to vote for Jeremy Corbyn, uh, did introduce into the Labour Party a much younger element. Uh, I'm not aware of any statistics that enable one to reckon its size, but the dominant voices uh, within Labour policy during the Cor Corbyn era were undoubtedly younger people. Uh, that has, of course, changed to some extent in Keir Starmer's time and is one of the things that has enabled him to establish very gradually and with some skill a degree of control over his own party, which was not achieved by his predecessors. Julie here. Thank you. Julie here from the Australian Financial Review and um, on the board of the National Press Club. Um, I don't know how much you know about modern Australian politics, but if you're not aware of this particular circumstance, well, if you could just take it as a hypothetical, I'd appreciate it. Um, but earlier this year, it became, we all became aware that the former Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, had appointed himself to five ministries. Uh, in most cases, the minister who held that ministry was unaware of it. Um, was this just idiosyncratic behaviour and 
you know, or is, was it a wholesale undermining of the Westminster system and democracy? Well, I, I am actually, I'm, first of all, I certainly wouldn't profess to be an expert on Australian politics, but I do take, you know, a, a general interest in it, and I was aware of that. Uh, that seemed to me, from a distance, to be uh, part of the authoritarian consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I mean, this is a, I don't want to go into uh, the problems surrounding lockdowns and so on, this is another issue altogether, but I don't think anyone would deny, whatever they think about lockdowns, uh, that uh, whether necessary or not, their adoption marked uh, a very remarkable increase in the authoritarian element in government, which for a democracy was a very startling change. Uh, and when I read about what Scott Morrison did and the, the basis on which he justified it, which is basically uh, I needed to be able to pull all the strings because otherwise I couldn't uh, manage the whole crisis, uh, is a very classic illustration of that. What it effectively amounts to saying is uh, that when you've got a pandemic like that, the only answer is to abandon the consultative basis of government, to put hands, the power in a single person's hands, uh, and to enable him single-handedly to make decisions. Now, I don't know how far Scott Morrison actually did that, but I find that the fact that he wanted to do it uh, tells us a great deal about what happens to societies when they start adopting mass coercion as an instrument of general policy. Okay, thank you. Kim Bergman. Uh, thank you for that. Kim Bergman from Asia Pacific Defence Reporter. Um, I'd like you to talk a little about the foreign policy consequences of Brexit, uh, because I think in summary, it seemed to be a case of uh, we'll get rid of these pesky Europeans and we'll turn to the Americans and indeed turn to Australia through things like AUKUS that will reorient ourselves to Asia. Um, does anyone in the UK actually seriously believe that? <laughs> um, a lot of people, uh, certainly at one stage, seriously believed that it would be possible to replicate the advantages of membership of the EU, the economic advantages, by trade deals with other countries. Um, that is a prospect that has looked increasingly illusory as time has gone on. Um, uh, the foreign policy implications, I think, are not quite the ones that you mentioned. Uh, Britain has uh, regarded itself as a, a close ally of the United States um, for a very long time, for reasons that lie completely independent of its relations with the European Union. Uh, Australia is another ally of the United States with which we have close defense and intelligence links. They are part of the Five Eyes intelligence circuit. Um, uh, and uh, there are quite close relationships between uh, the Australian and British Civil Service, uh, even to the point where um, uh, a number of Australians have been transferred from Australian Civil Service to the British one, or have settled in Britain uh, and become British civil servants, sometimes at a very senior level. So I think that this is all actually very old. But there is a very significant consequence for uh, foreign policy, uh, not one, I suspect, that many people in government have really thought about. The, the in, if you try to distill a single theme from 600 years of British foreign policy, uh, it is this, that the main object of foreign policy in the United Kingdom has been to uh, avoid a situation in which a single power dominates the whole of Europe. That has always been regarded as something that would be a, a mortal problem uh, for the UK. And that's a theme that goes back to Queen Elizabeth, to the 18th century, to the Napoleonic Wars, and to the 20th century wars. The departure of Britain from the EU will bring about precisely the consequence that 600 years of British statesmanship has tried to avoid. Because what will happen is that the EU will progressively 
integrate more and more, it is more likely to do that and more likely to do it faster as a result of the departure of the UK, because although there were a, a number of countries in the EU which shared the UK's view, the UK was the leading exponent uh, of maintaining the autonomy of the, um, uh, 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 of the member states, particularly in areas like foreign policy. So I think that over the next half century, we must expect to see a progressive uh, coming together politically as well as economically uh, of the other members of the EU. Um, and uh, that will mean uh, that we will be facing uh, a single enormous political power uh, occupying substantially the whole of Europe uh, from the Atlantic uh, to the frontiers of Russia. Um, I think that that is, uh, in the long term, a dangerous position for the United Kingdom to be in. It will only be avoided by our going to some lengths to establish political links with the EU of a kind that will be regarded as profoundly objectionable by the many people in the UK who regard the EU as Satan. Um, uh, and it will be a source of controversy, but it's the only way that we are going to get ourselves out of the hole that we've dug for ourselves. Thank you. Ben Westcott. Hello, Ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Um, I want to stick with international affairs for a moment. Um, you uh, became a non-permanent member of the Hong Kong Final Court of Appeal in 2019, December 2019, after six months of very uh, raucous pro-democracy protests in the city. And earlier this year, you uh, decided to stay on in that role uh, when some of your uh, international colleagues resigned. I suppose I wanted to know, uh, why did you take that role in the first place at that controversial time? And why did you stay on uh, earlier this year? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I'm not going to comment on the policies of the Chinese government uh, in Hong Kong, uh, because as a serving judge, I am not uh, ethically, in a, I have no right to do so. Uh, I could express my views more freely if I resigned, but I think what you are asking me is, why don't I? <laughs> uh, and and the, the answer to that is this. Uh, I uh, joined the CFA at a time before the national security law was enacted. Um, obviously, uh, one has to think one's position out uh, when a significant change like that occurs. I think that there are two reasons why one might wish uh, to resign. One of them is that you do not think that the rule of law applies in the courts anymore. The other is that or even if the rule of law applies in the courts, the law that they are administering uh, is repellent. Um, now, uh, the rule of law does apply in the courts. I know that this is often controverted, but I'm afraid it's true. The courts do apply the law. Uh, they are not subject to political direction from Beijing or from the uh, executive government of Hong Kong. Uh, the process of selection uh, is not politically biased. Um, you will have to take my word for that, but I assure you that from both the inside and the outside of that problem, that is the case. The real question is about the substance of, of the uh, national security law. Uh, now, the position about that is that there have been a large number of prosecutions, uh, most of which uh, have not yet come to trial. Um, when they come to trial, they will raise questions of law, which um, uh, some of which will be quite difficult. The NSL has provisions preserving rights of protest, for example. The impact to be, the, the implications of that will have to be properly worked out. At the moment, the law uh, as it stands after the enactment of the NSL uh, is uh, not entirely certain. Uh, indeed, at appellate level, it's wholly uncertain because hardly any of these issues have reached either the Court of Appeal uh, or the Court of Final Appeal. Uh, I uh, take the view that the only uh, consideration for a serving judge in Hong Kong is what is in the interest of the people of Hong Kong. 
I am totally uninfluenced uh, by the views of the UK government, or any other government for that matter, um, uh, because it seems to me uh, that what they are doing is engaging in a political protest against the policies of the Chinese government. Now, uh, that is something which governments, of course, frequently do. There's nothing particularly surprising about that. Uh, but it is not the function of a serving judge in any jurisdiction to engage in political protests of any kind, and I absolutely decline to do so. The only question that I ask myself is, will the withdrawal uh, of the overseas judges from the CFA benefit the people of Hong Kong? It seems to me to be perfectly obvious that the answer to that question is no. Thank you. Simon Gross. Simon Gross from Canberra IQ. Um, you had a piece in the Australian newspaper on the weekend about uh, the threats to democracy. Um, your comments about the um, uh, state of um, how, how a UK parties elect their um, leaders uh, seems to uh, seem to doubt the enfranchisement of the of the wide leadership, um, you you mentioned uh, the fact that uh, activists in the Labor Party got Jeremy Corbyn in. Mm -hmm. You said that the party, the Conservatives, foisted mistrust on the the parliamentary party. Uh, uh, we have here we have a, a Labor Party which has an enfranchised membership with some kind of. Um, Qualified uh, powers for the for the parliamentary party to over, overturn that, but our conservative parties, both uh, uh, the, the leaders, uh, the, the the parliamentary members elect the the leaders. Uh, do you see that as a preferred uh, a model, or do you see uh, a future for enfranchising the broad party membership? I think that. Uh, the leader of a party uh, should be elected by its serving MPs and no one else. I think that because uh, the serving MPs uh, are the people who have a direct interest in ensuring that the party appeals to the widest possible spectrum of opinion in, in the country at large. That seems to me to be uh, a flexible process, but a highly beneficial one uh, for the relations between political parties and opinion. The alternative is to hand power to a body of people who are not likely to be representative even of those who vote for their party, let alone uh, representative uh, of the country at large, because basically they have no one's interest or opinions to consider uh, but their own. It is the main single factor that lies behind the polarization of, of politics in the UK. Uh, the polarization of politics has been a destructive factor in every country where it has been significant. The United States is an obvious example. This is our version of it, and I'm against it. But is there a danger that uh, the political parties uh, seem to be uh, um, uh, uh, like a drift from their broader membership and alienate their membership? Well, I think that is, I don't regard it as a danger. I regard it as, uh, as highly desirable. And, <laughs> and, and I don't actually think that, that in modern conditions, uh, political parties need to be dependent uh, on uh, a body of active supporters. Um, okay. Basically, they will... So how do they raise money? Uh, Sorry? How do they raise money? Well, they may, have, they may have great difficulty in raising money, but I doubt it, because uh, the parties will have a program which uh, donors and contributors at every level will either like or dislike, and if they like it, they may be able to put their money where their mouth is. A significant proportion of donations to political parties in the United Kingdom come from people who are not actually active members of, of the party. Um, essentially, political parties are brands representing a loose uh, ideological outlook. Uh, and uh, I see no reason why membership 
uh, a subscription paying membership uh, and uh, influence on the part of the members in the decisions of the parties should be uh, necessary for the party's existence. Indeed, I think it is necessary to avoid that result if one is going to avoid the party's extinction. Uh, in my view, if the Labour Party had continued uh, to uh, insist uh, that only a Corbynist-style programme was acceptable to them, the Labour Party would have died probably in the course of the current Parliament. I think if the Conservatives uh, persist in adopt, uh, applying at governmental level the opinions of their active membership, they will die too. Final question is from Mr Schubert. Uh, Commissioner Schubert, as the Vice President of the National Press Club, Lord Sunshine, thank you for your address today. Um, somewhat dispiriting in its uh, yeah, <laughs> analysis of the state of contemporary British um, discourse. I, I wondered if I could just ask you to reflect briefly on uh, two things. Um, your thoughts on whether there's an attribute of the Australian political system currently that you think the British political system could usefully borrow back or borrow, and the same in return. Is there something, notwithstanding the sort of uh, uh, <laughs> clarity of your analysis about the challenges for Britain, something that the Australian political system could usefully draw from the British uh, political tradition? Um, well... Uh I don't really have enough knowledge of the Australian political system to be able to give a useful answer to the latter part of that question. But there is certainly one aspect of, Isra uh, of Australian politics we which we could usefully adopt in England, um, and that is the electoral system. Uh, I, uh, I mean, Australia operates a, um, either a single or multiple alternative vote system, as I understand it, at federal level. Uh, but has uh, PR systems in the states. I think that's correct, is it not? Uh, the Senate also operates. Broadly them. speaking. Yeah. Uh, I, I would very much favour the introduction of proportional representation in the United Kingdom. I haven't always taken that view. I used to believe that the stability produced uh, by first-past-the-post was uh, worth the obvious disadvantages. I no longer think that because the tendency of membership-driven parties to produce programs that tend to the extremes mean that the electorate has a very limited choice of, uh, of policies. Now, one way of dealing with this is to have more and smaller parties so that uh, a wider spectrum of opinion in the electorate is actually represented politically. Uh, and that would undoubtedly mean more coalitions. Um, uh, it would mean uh, that uh, negotiations would have to occur between parties to form a stable government, um, uh, and the result would not be uh, what... Uh, it wouldn't be the ne plus ultra of every, of every activist member. Uh, I don't see that that's a problem at all. I think it's a considerable advantage. And I think that it is a better road to stability than the position that we've got ourselves into with first past the post. So that's an Australian principle uh, that I would accept. Uh, following Australian politics from a great distance, I'm particularly liable to get it spectacularly wrong. <laughs> uh, what I detect in uh, Australian politics uh, is a certain abrasiveness in its rhetoric which isn't necessarily reflective of the way that government is actually conducted. Um, uh, uh, so that I think that probably uh, there are very few lessons that you can learn uh, from us um, uh, at the moment. Doubtless, there will be some in future. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Lord Jonathan. Sh <laughs> this is... This, uh, Membership of Press Club, which we actually get into the Press Club in London as well. Oh, so. That's very kind of you. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Now, just we'll, we'll... No, no, no. <laughs> also about you. <laughs>